at Oakland University in Rochester, Michigan, where he teaches courses in training and development. He has consulted with many Fortune 500 organizations in enterprise performance improvement and learning solutions, including at e-learning design and development, distance education, organization development, and stand-up training. His research interests include the role of trust in the client-consultant relationship. He will be presenting students' as avatars, pedagogy, psychology, and learning. Welcome, William. Thank you, Dylan, for the introduction. I appreciate that very much. Um, I'm just reading through the chat here, and I thought maybe, just so that I know, okay, so Sue is on now. Um, if you don't mind, maybe, why don't, can we just text into your local chat if you can hear me speaking. Just type in yes, if you can hear me speaking, so that I know how to go about this presentation. Okay, Alina can hear, I think, and so can Sue, right? Testing one, two, three. I'll just keep chatting here. On and happy. Yay, yay. Okay, great. All right. That's excellent. Okay, then I'm going, I'll get rolling here, and um, I'll do this um, cognizant of the fact that it, it appears that I'm the only thing that stands between you and a uh, dance party. So um, I will... Uh, I will try to keep things uh, moving along and, uh, and flowing and all that kind of stuff. So um, uh, if you have any questions, you know, as we th go throughout here, just feel free to either type them in or however we'd go about that. And, um, you know, we'll just kind of do it on the fly fairly informally here. Um, uh, a little bit about myself first. Um, as Dylan mentioned, I, uh, I teach at Oakland University which is, uh, I'd say, a mid-sized university in Michigan. We've got about 20,000 students. And um, I primarily teach e-learning, um, the science of instruction, and um, uh, courses like that. So what my focus is today is um, talking about uh, my experience with, uh, with using avatars in my classrooms and some of the, um, the psychological stuff that goes on beneath it and is kind of the foundation for, um, I think, allowing it to be such a powerful and meaningful um, um, instrument in terms of instruction. Um, so that's what I'm going to talk about today. I, I started um, getting into virtual worlds about seven years ago um, in Second Life. Uh, I was just very intrigued by it, and I went there and kind of explored and you know flew around and went into all sorts of sims. And um, uh, one day I stumbled upon a sim, and the owner came up to me and said, hey, we're doing this experiment. Would you be interested? And basically it was... Um, these little, these little mini meditations that that we would we were practicing through the day, and then we'd come and talk about it. So we were in these small groups group settings, and um, we would just talk about our experiences. And um, I was just blown away by how powerful and meaningful um, it all was. And so that's that's kind of the um, the onus that I had to consider using this kind of a forum um, for my classroom activities. So. Um, so, so that's kind of the background to this. So um, here is the agenda for what I'm going to talk about. Um, it's really the use of avatars um, in, in any kind of a setting, but primarily, you know, in my instance, it's in an instructional setting. And the psychology around that, um, some of the pedagogy uh, involved with the classroom and the decisions that I, that I make and, and how that affects and impacts learning, and then um, I'll show you a, uh, an example, and we'll kind of walk through one of the instructional um, that we actually do in the classroom. So before I hop right into it, um, as another uh, uh, aspect of helping me know kind of where, where we're at as a group, how many of you out there are instructors or, or facilitate, you know, online sessions uh, in virtual world so that I can kind of get a feel? You can just type into your chat, I am, or I do, or something like that. That would help me uh, know where you're coming from. And I, and I can uh, focus the presentation a little bit on that. So just go ahead and do the Professor Chatterbox. Is. Okay, great. Okay, and those of you who, are, who aren't, um, you know, a lot of people are. Okay, great. So I know that at least a good... 
understand where. Thanks for letting me know. Okay, so let's hop into this um, and get going. So um, the last presentation was 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 great. Um, the builds were beautiful. Um, a lot of it was about the actual um, in the simulator. What what I'm focusing in on is a little bit more of what goes on in the human interaction between between human beings as avatars. So what I do for my classes is I um, I actually create the avatars for my students. Um, I, I use the uh, the Diva Distro, um, which I know allows for for users to create their own avatars. But I want to make the learning curve um, as as little steep as possible. So what I do is, um, as I create the avatars, and one of the things that I do try to is I do try to um, customize the avatar uh, to the correct gender and to the and by correct I just mean you know the physical physical ethnicity of the students. After they can uh, after they've been in for a bit, I want to. to go ahead and customize their avatar but right out of the gates I try to make things good to go from the from the get-go um, so all I have to do is really just resin world right click and sit this is the uh, the purpose of our uh, small group discussions okay so this is uh, an avatar that I created for one and uh, um, the pieces that I got I got from the great uh, developer community who put stuff out there free and sim Okay, chatterbox, sound is cutting in and out. Okay, well, I will just continue forward, and hopefully it'll it'll clean itself up. Up, and if it does not, then um. Where we can go from student and now now, uh, now I'll talk a little bit about this this idea that I had mentioned before about some of the psychological um, behind the use of avatar. Uh, I'm gonna type in here to the local chat. Are we having problems with the sound? And I'll try to get feedback on that. Okay. Uh, so, in terms of avatars and psychology, uh, um, I'm going to talk about three things briefly. And this idea of social prior cognitive science, of science uh, about avatar in education interaction. What we're really talking about is the sense of being. Um, social presence can occur when we're having a phone call with our friend. So we don't have to be physically co-present. Okay. Okay, so I am I am back on and talking here, and sounds a little bit better. Okay, so I'm going to talk here and just continue on here. Um, so I'll continue on. Hopefully, this is better. Okay, so the idea of um, okay, great, good, good. So social presence is kind of obvious, I think, to those of us who are who are here, you know, at this conference. We we kind of get that. Uh, a subset of the idea of social presence is this idea of virtual presence. Great, I'm glad that the sound is better. Good. So virtual presence uh, is the psychological sense of being present in a virtual learning environment, and this parallels, in my mind, kind of. What what is called the the 
the suspension of disbelief. You know, if you go to a play or you go to a movie and um, you're so involved in it that you kind of forget that you are not there. You, you are in all reality there because, because all of the stuff in between has kind of melted away. And this is something that, that can happen in the virtual world, as I, as I think most of us would, uh, would concur. So throughout my presentation, I've got some, some pictures of my class setting. And I break up my class into small groups because I think it becomes unmanageable at a, at a quantity of, of over eight. So I, I generally only go up to eight into the, in the small group conversation. So um, what you'll see are these images. And then I'm going to read to you actual uh, comments made by uh, students after the class. And I should say at this point, too, that my class is a graduate level class. It's a 600 level class, which at Oakland University is as high as you can go in the master's program before getting into a PhD. Program. So these are last semester or maybe second to last semester. Um, grad They're fairly mature in their, uh, at least in their education, um, but more work full time as well. Um, are generally over five. Um, they are so. Anyway, again, so going to read this this comment, but it has to do with the idea of presence. I felt even though we weren't there, I felt like we actually were. Like it's not just typing. Like you could see the class sitting together. I can focus so much better than if it's just a typing session. So really, what this is doing is this is comparing in the student's mind the difference between doing something like a live chat where it's just text and boxes kind of going by, um, or even something like an asynchronous um, discussion forum type of a situation or activity. So this, this idea of co-presence makes you feel like you're there and you're actually part of the conversation, which is really key to affecting the learning outcomes. So here's another comment, and I'll read this one as well. I just feel like, I don't know. I don't know if it's truly that they don't see themselves as an avatar, I know that feels really deep, but I feel like people felt really comfortable to just type it and give themselves a chance to edit and like think about what they wanted to say and have a chance to kind of defend what they're trying to put out there. So just like being in a classroom setting or face to face, there it's conversational and you can make your comments and you can defend your comments and you can um, interact with other people and follow the flow, uh, the natural flow and the organic flow of the conversation. One of the, the real powerful things, though, about this idea of presence is that an avatar is, in a sense, the great equalizer. And to students, that's a really key thing. By that, I mean that if you are in an avatar, everyone is kind of the same. So in a classroom, you might have the student that typically might sit in the back row, not raise their hand as much or make, their, make comments or ask questions as often as the student that might sit in the front row, who might be very boisterous, um, very outgoing, and being a big part of the class. And as a class develops through time, those behaviors only become the greater. The quiet students become more quiet. The more outgoing students become more outgoing. And to my experience... The avatar-based instruction, at least in a small group setting, is the great equalizer to that. And I find that the students who are more quiet in the classroom tend to be much more outgoing and tend to be much more involved when it's in a small group setting as avatars. So that's, I think, a real key um, takeaway from my experience in terms of using this kind of technology. So this was mentioned in the keynote yesterday, but the idea of social learning. Um, we all learn socially. So this is nothing unique. We all also can learn, obviously, just as an individual on our own. But social learning is extremely powerful. Um, so it, it is, by definition, a change in the learner's knowledge due to interacting with other people. So when we can enhance and augment interacting with other people, then that would be a very powerful tool to use. So here's another comment that I'm going to read to you. In real time, in the chat, it's fast. And there's always new subjects and people talk about a lot of different content that was covered in the chapter. So you really have to be knowledgeable about it and familiar with it 
in order to be able to participate in the discussion. So one of the things that I love about this, this comment is that what it's saying is that you have to be prepared. So in essence, this is actually kind of like a flipped classroom. The, the class that I run is, is a, uh, a seminar type of a class uh, at the graduate level. So what I require the students to do is they have to do readings prior to coming to the class session. And then in the class session, one student will be assigned to do a very brief um, uh, written presentation that I distribute to all the other students via a note card. The students will all read through that, and then we will discuss that as basically a conversation starter. But if a student hasn't done the reading or hasn't done the work to prepare, it becomes obvious pretty quickly because it's not like you can have the book next to you and uh, try to be involved with the conversation because it's going to pass you by. So you really have to be knowledgeable about it and familiar with it, as the student says, in order to keep up with the conversation. So one of the key things here that occurred to me is that there's a theory in psychology called discourse theory. And discourse theory, I think, plays a very significant role in students being avatars. So basically, discourse theory explains how, as human beings, we have a very powerful reaction to being involved in a conversation. So if somebody looks at us and says, hi, and looks us in the eyes and asks us a question, then deep within our, our psychological makeup, we have a heightened awareness, we are more present in the current situation, in the current context, and we are more immediately aware of, of this communication. So discourse theory suggests that once, as human beings, we are involved in this kind of a situation, everything is, is kind of heightened. So discourse theory, I think, is, is vital in terms of instruction and also in terms of how it would work with avatars. So in essence, discourse theory talks about social cues, like maybe making eye contact with somebody would be a social cue, saying somebody's name would be a social cue. So if we have some kind of an instructional moment and we can put a social cue in there to use somebody's name like, hey, Jim, what did you think about this topic? Well, Jim's attention is going to be heightened. We've used a social cue. And what we do is we activate a social response within Jim. So Jim has this heightened, heightened social response because this has been activated. What that yields is an increase in Jim's active cognitive processing. So basically, his brain kicks into high gear to be able to deal with whatever this, this engagement and this communication is going to require of him. Now, in an instructional setting, if we can follow these steps, then what it can do is it can yield to an increase in the quality of whatever our learning outcome might be. So obviously, in terms of avatars, is if we have this, this presence, this virtual presence, and we can utilize these kind of social cues to really engage our students, and maybe that's even the big topic of what this is all about, is about student engagement, then we can enhance the quality of what we're trying to teach them in the first place, which is, which is to enhance the, the, the quality of their, of their learning outcomes. Okay. So what we're looking at now is um, the third part of what I wanted to talk about with psychology, and this is basically where, where modern cognitive science today can contribute to uh, how we look about instructing students and just learners overall. Um, cognitive science offers these four aspects of, of cognitive science, and the first is the idea of dual channels. And I'll be really brief on these these four things, but they're they're very very uh, they're very interesting to me anyway, and they're I think they're very important in terms of putting together instruction for students. So the idea of dual channels has to do with the fact that in our brain, we actually have two distinct channels that process information as it comes in. The first channel focuses on the image side of the world, really. So, for example, I'm looking outside my window right now, and I have a maple tree out there, and I see these green maple leaves. So the side of my, the channel, the channel of my brain that focuses on, on images and the perception of images and the processing of that is looking at those leaves and seeing green leaf. 
Now, the other side of this dual channel is the side that sees um, or that processes rather things in terms of uh, verbal information. So this can either be through the auditory channel and hearing things, hearing words, or through reading text. So both of those things, reading text and hearing words, goes through this second channel, this auditory channel. So on one channel we have images, and on the second we have verbal. And in summary, what cognitive science uh, research tells us is that as instructors, if we can effectively combine these two channels together and focus on one specific piece of information, we're more apt to successfully have, have whatever learning outcome we're looking for. Okay, so that's the idea of dual channels. Um, the second I idea here is limited capacity, and this is really important because it's, it's super easy to um, inundate uh, our students or learners or really, really anybody who doesn't have the same uh, level of, of knowledge or experience that we have. So back in the 1950s, um, a, a professor from Harvard named George Miller uh, wrote an article about the number seven and how seven seemed to be this magic number in terms of the way that we remember things. That that seven seems to be really about as much as one person can hold in their working memory at any one piece of time. And it doesn't seem like a very big number, does it? Um, but Miller suggested that really seven plus or minus two, so anywhere from five to nine, is is all that our that our limited minds, our limited working memory in our mind can hold at one time. Well, recent research has actually downed that number to about four, plus or minus two. So what this more recent research is saying is, no, really, guys, it's like somewhere between two and six pieces of information is all that distinct information is all that one person can really hold at one time. So we need to be aware that simplifying things, chunking things, and presenting things in a manner that's easily and readily digestible is very important. Okay, number three here has to do with learners being active. Uh, now, yesterday in the keynote, there was talk about constructivism. And in essence, what constructivism talks about is how the individual learner constructs their own reality and constructs their own learning. Well, that's not so different from what cognitive scientists talk about in terms of active processing. So the first thing that happens is selection. And selection is basically that of all of the, the myriad things that are, are going into our senses at one time, we need to be able to select in on the one thing that it is we need to focus on, or else we will be easily overwhelmed. Organization has to do with how we then um, process that information and categorize it in a way that's meaningful to us. Integration is then how we take that now and store it into our long-term memory based on something that we can relate it to, like either our previous experience or knowledge that we might hold um, that can help to ground that information. And then lastly is transfer, which is basically how can we apply this um, in the real world, either immediately or perhaps in, um, uh, in, in two or three months down the road uh, in an effective manner. Okay, so there, there are, in essence, three demands on how our learners process information. The first is what's called extraneous processing. And as the name would suggest, this is what our learner has to go through that's extra. It's extraneous. So it's outside the core processing that we want a learner to do in order to learn whatever it is we're teaching them. So, for example, when, um, when I have students come into my sim for the first time, almost 90% of what's going on is extraneous because they're trying to figure out the interface. They're trying to figure out how to walk. They're trying to figure out how to sit. They're trying to figure out all that kind of stuff. And all those things are outside, you know, what we're really trying to learn there, which is the content of the course. So for their immediate purposes, it's extraneous. The essential processing is that which contributes to them learning the content. So this is really the vital part of it. 
the stuff that needs to be done within their own their own mind in order to learn what they're what they're learning. The third part is the generative processing. And this one is the one that I believe that Avatar use uh, for students is actually really powerful because this has to do with a student's motivation. It has to do with how much energy they put into their own learning and how involved they are in their own learning. And I think that the social presence that avatars allow for and the great equalizing that avatars allow for can yield to a to a very positive effect on generative processing. So generative processing is this processing that's aimed at the deeper understanding of the core material. And it's created by the learner's motivation. So this is the key one that I think we can really affect with, you know, using avatars in an educational situation. So what this at least created in my mind was this idea of an equation. And that is that we have these three demands on our learner, these three processing requirements. One is this extraneous processing, the stuff that we don't really want. The second is the essential processing, which is what we really need. And the third is the generative processing, which students need so that they can learn better. Now, the sum total of all these things, they're all demands, right? But the sum total of these things needs to be less than the individual's cognitive load. So in other words, if a student says to you, oh my gosh, I'm so lost, or, or I, there's just so much information here, I just can't keep up, um, what's happened is that the cognitive load of the student or the learner has been exceeded. And if the cognitive load has been exceeded, then the learning outcomes have been negatively affected. So through instruction, what we want to do is we want to, to, to uh, minimize that extraneous stuff, maximize the essential stuff, and really support the, uh, the generative stuff. And the good news is that through instruction, we can impact these things through the way that we design the instruction and through the way that we facilitate our, um, our, our, our courses. Okay, so how are we doing out there? Are there are we are we good? Are we are we asleep? Are we are we thinking about the dance party? Okay, well I'll just keep on cruising along here. Okay, so let's talk a little bit now about pedagogy and how this is going on. Okay, great. Thanks, Professor Chatterbox. And sometimes it's nice just to have some kind of feedback. I'm just looking at a, you know, a screen of, uh, of avatars and chairs. Okay, thanks, Sue. Okay, so in terms of ped pedagogy, um, there's three things that I was going to talk about uh, briefly here. The idea of blending, um, which uh, we probably, some of us would have experience with the idea of blending uh, uh, instruction, timing, how to prepare students for this kind of a thing, entering a virtual world, um, some, some tips on facilitating this, and then lastly and, and pretty importantly, the, the idea of context and how that affects uh, avatars and, and the learning. So what I did is I, um, in one of the teaches I, 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 one of the classes I teach, rather, I use a book by William Horton, who's an e-learning designer, and he has a checklist. So what I did is I took his checklist and I just changed it a little bit to talk about avatar use. So I guess what I'm doing is I'm giving a, a verbal citation to uh, William Horton on this uh, slide since I don't, have, uh, I don't have any text up there. So before one would consider using an avatar for a class, it might behoove them to run through a checklist similar to this to make sure it's the right thing to do because it has to really be all about the outcomes. And if using avatars in a classroom can help achieve those outcomes or enhance it, then that would be the appropriate use. Um, but there's obviously several situations that I could think of offhand where it probably would be better not to use an avatar. Um, the reason that I enjoy it for my classes is because in the small group discussions, I think it really engenders thoughtful um, uh, sharing of information through chat, which I, I think is, is very powerful. So the first question is, is avatar use appropriate? 
Um, the second is knowing your audience. Yes, Uncle Edelman. I think that thinking deeply is very important. And I think slowing things down through, through, um, through a chat, throwing the pace down and, and, and making, allowing people the, the chance to think deeply about it is one, thing, one of the things that's enhanced through using avatars. Um, understanding your audience, who are they? You know, I would do this very differently for a graduate class than I would for an undergraduate class. Clarifying the objectives um, is, is extremely important, too, whether it's a business setting or whether it is an educational setting in acad academia, trying to relate them to children, running workshops in a business setting. Oh, yeah, okay. Yes, a lot of, I think, in terms of media design, um, the psychology that I'm referring to would affect your media design and using this in a, be in a business setting. Um, understanding the learner's prerequisite skills and that people are going to be at different levels. In our master's program, I have students who are maybe as young as 25 all the way up to the age of maybe, well, at least into their 60s and their mid-60s. So um, obviously we have uh, tech, tech natives uh, and tech non-natives, so that has to be addressed differently. Setting guidelines, which I'll give you an example of in a, a few minutes. Communicating how evaluation works, uh, which is very important because the quality of the discussion in these live settings is what I grade. So it's important that they know that so that they can um, proactively uh, um, determine how they're going to be communicating. And then lastly, is this is very active on the part of the um, instructor, is active monitoring and active guiding um, throughout the process. So, okay, talking about the blended, uh, the blended aspect here. So blended uh, instruction combines face-to-face -face classroom methods with computer-mediated activities to form an integrated instructional approach. When I first started doing the avatars for this, um, this graduate uh, seminar class, I did all but three sessions as avatars in the sim. So I, our first class we met face-to-face, -face, our last class we met face-to-face, -face, and then once in the middle. And I found that that was too much as avatars. So the second time I ran it, I went 50%, 50% face-to-face -face and 50, uh, 50 face-to-face -face and 50 as avatars. And that felt so much better, not only to me, but to the students as well, because the different environments obviously lend themselves to different um, different social cues and different ways of sharing information and sharing thoughts. So here's one of the, uh, the quotes from one of the students. I like that it's balanced. I like that there's time where you're in class, so you, you get those networking and those other opportunities to learn from each other. So in class, you have more of that bond, those relationships that you've formed. I have another student who, who, uh, who made a quote that I don't have in this presentation, but she basically said that it's really nice to be able to see people's faces in the real world first. So then when you come into a virtual world, you, you can see the face behind the avatar, and that makes, uh, that makes for a more uh, strong connection uh, between that person. So there's some benefits to doing, um, to doing this uh, live you know, at the same time, and that is that we have uh, the potential to learn from others uh, in a more profound way than something like, let's say, a discussion forum. Uh, also, the facilitator is present, and the facilitator can answer questions as a content expert um, in terms of the subject matter, uh, but also just helping to uh, facilitate. Um, and this also positively affects motivation. Okay, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to, I think, go ahead a few slides so one of the things I wanted to point out, though, is, is the importance of student preparation. And for those of us who've done this, this is probably um, old hat, but one of the, uh, one of the researchers into this, uh, this kind of work has suggested that there's three dangers. The first is the idea of structure. So structure is the navigation and the graphical user interface and um, things like learning how to walk, you know, in a virtual world. So being able to prepare students that way is, is actually pretty vital. Response strategies has to do with making sure that students understand the expectations placed upon them about how they should respond and how they should um, act and how they should communicate within these, these new environments. And the use of tools has to do with how 
are they how are they expected to and what are the um I guess the potential opportunities for them. All I have is um, appearance of your avatar. They turn into changing out your shape and your clothes and whatnot. Class during a meaningful content appearance. So right around a campfire, and this one stands up, changes appearance, and is changing his wigs and is changing his jackets and all this kind of stuff. The use tools was inappropriate and it falls on me is there because I obviously didn't clarify it enough to him that that's a, an inappropriate use. We need to clarify these things, setting ground rules. Um, the first and, and best place for that is in the syllabus, but also we need to do it in class during, during an in-class session to prep or and uh, in, the, uh, in the virtual world. And then if we have a content management system like Blackboard or Moodle or whatever, um, the course site is also another place to, to communicate that. So what I wanted to do is just share with you um, the chat guidelines that I have as a note card in class that I hand out to the students during the first class. So as they're sitting around the, uh, the campfire, I'll, I'll just uh, drop this note card on them and ask them all to read through it, and then we'll discuss it so that we have you know, a clear understanding of, of, you know, what the proper chat guidelines would be. I think it does both. Um, the question is, does the environment level the field or just change the field? Um, most certainly it changes the field um, because the social cues are different and more focused because there's fewer of them. You know, the social cues would be basically calling somebody by, by name in the chat window or by looking at them with the avatar. So, so those two things, I think, are the most powerful social cues. And the quality of how you uh, type your, your verbiage is also very important. Um, so it definitely changes it. But I think it's an equalizer, too, in that students aren't aware or they're not um, uh, worried so much about maybe their physical appearance or the way they speak. I've had... Um, I've had ESL students uh, do the avatars, uh, English as a second language, and um, they have found it to be actually somewhat freeing because they were less concerned about their accent being not understood. So I think it's a little bit of both. That's a, that's a very interesting question. And then I, I also share with them just some common chat acronyms because some of them might not know this. Okay, so... Um, one of the things I wanted to share, too, are just some of the facilitation tips. So in these settings, truly, the instructor is way more of a guide than the traditional lecturer. So that's one thing to, um, to keep in mind. Um, the guidance is through um, reflection, asking thought-provoking questions, providing immediate feedback, and using, ho using humor as possible. So here's another quote. It depends on the instructor if you're engaged or not. So if it's just one question and everyone answers, I feel that those answers can get lost. But if you directly ask one learner the question and they answer, I think that keeps the learners engaged. And another quote. Another thing I liked about the bonfire discussions was for me to take time to read somebody's thought and then type again. A lot of times I was thinking about it more than I normally would in class where you just, you know, shoot up your hand and say it out loud, shooting bullets. Okay, so I'm going to show just a couple more quotes of students and then... Um, we're going to call it uh, a presentation here because we are running out of time. Okay, so here's another set of quotes. Whoops, let me go back one. Okay, hang on, sorry. Okay, here we go. 
So here's a student. If I miss something, well, if it's online, I can go back and be like, oh, that's what that person said. So it's like a dialogue, and I can go back instead of having to interrupt the conversation and say, wait, what did you say? It's like a way of being able to do it on your own. And this is in response directly to the fact that, um, that you can post your chat logs right in the, to your content management system, which is what I do. And then here's a final quote. This was a, a student who was very surprised after taking, taking the class as, as an avatar. I actually really liked it a lot. I learned a lot. I was surprised. Okay, so that's it. Um, I really appreciate everyone's attendance. Um, thank you for your patience in, uh, in sitting through this. And if you have any uh, questions or you want to discuss anything, I'm happy to, uh, to stay around um, before I go out to the, uh, the dance party. Okay, thank you, Bill, for a terrific <laughs> presentation. As a reminder to our audience, you can see what's coming up on the conference schedule. This was the last presentation in the education track. You may want to attend the live music closing party, which is on OS Grid. Now, I've been told in chat there's a correction to the hypergrid coordinates that uh, these ones that I just pasted into chat are the correct ones. So hopefully they are, and I'll see you all there. And thank you again to our speaker and the audience. Thank you for attending this conference. It's been a great time. Bye-bye.